questions? I have a question. So, so if you would be, for example, interested in doing, you, okay, you have shown interesting example of vector sparse matrix multiplication, right? So what, uh, I think someone asked this question, but maybe I didn't hear the answer, or maybe I didn't understand. So uh, if you would be interested in doing uh, dense matrix, sparse matrix multiplication, so what would be your first choice? We would just extend, would you, uh, what would be your first approach? Would you just think, okay, dense matrix is just the collection of the vectors, so maybe I'll just do it this way, or what would be your starting point? Uh, yeah, the easiest thing to do, to do sparse matrix times dense matrix, is to essentially treat it as a bunch of repeated instances of sparse matrix vector products, uh, and just to kind of tweak the kernels a bit to perform multiple multiplications as they, as they go through the matrix. I think that would actually be a perfectly reasonable implementation strategy. We, uh, I don't think we've actually built that code but it's the obvious place to start, and as I said earlier, uh, that's always where you should start. Uh, there might be, perhaps, some little tweaks you could perform that would make it better, but it seems pretty reasonable to me. But wouldn't you miss some of the data reuse opportunities? Some of the data reuse, uh, you mean with the matrix? In, uh, when you treat the uh, matrix matrix uh, as a matrix factor. Uh, yes, well, you will, you will get some reuse, right? So the question is, well, if you write the code the right way, uh, you'll get perfect reuse of all the entries in the sparse matrix. Uh, you will not necessarily get good reuse of the dense entries in the dense matrix unless it's ordered so that the cache is able to give you a lot of, coherent, uh, a lot of uh, temporal reuse. Mm -hmm. The problem is you have little control over that, right? I mean, since the sparse matrix is sparse, you have to do a gather from the dense matrix. And so you can't do the kind of tiling tricks that you might be able to do in the purely dense case. Right. So the best thing that you can do, at least to first order, is to make sure that you have good reuse of the sparse entries and optionally reorder the dense matrix so that your access pattern you hope will be good. Or sorry, reorder the sparse matrix so your access pattern to the dense matrix will be good. But that, as I said, it's a function of the data, so you can't necessarily control that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any other questions? So, um, Michael, um, maybe... I should have said something more controversial, I guess. Yeah, uh, uh, so uh, I think there's some interesting insight that, um, about the reduction example that, uh, that you use. So uh, it, it may be uh, a, a good idea to uh, actually uh, explicitly talk about the overhead that um, that makes the uh, the reduction. You mentioned like um, uh, the idle threads and so on. And um, you know, how about um, uh, barrier synchronization? You know, what what are the what are the main uh, you know factors that you know for sure that are uh, making this style of reduction uh, slower than the uh, the other way around? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that's worth emphasizing. So there's there's two levels at which to look at the problem of what's inefficient about this kernel. There's the sort of building block of doing reduction, parallel reduction within a thread block. And then there's sort of the kernel level, how do I launch my kernels and organize my work? <coughs> so if you remember, this is the code that's doing the intra-block summation. And this is the picture that goes along with it. Mm -hmm. So the, the first thing you'll notice in this picture, which I alluded to earlier, is Look at, look at which threads are active. Right? In the first line, only half of them are active. Right? Those are the brighter ones. The ones that are grayed out, they're inactive. So in the first step, half my threads are active. Then a quarter. Then, you know, and so on. Right? So I have, every time I cut the number of active threads in half. Now, uh, that's more or less unavoidable, the way this particular reduction uh, works. Uh, you know, I, the kind of the summations I can perform are those which are independent, which lie in separate branches of the summation tree. And of course, as I sum up, I have fewer and fewer values that I can perform summation on in parallel. So that's unavoidable. However, I can amortize the cost of having these inactive threads by having each one of them do as much work as possible before it gets to this picture. 
Right? So I said it's good to maximize the amount of sequential work per thread. So if you imagine if this is expensive, if having lots of inactive threads is bad, then what I should have done is before I get to this stage, have every thread sum up eight values or 16 values or something that's you know, relatively big in comparison to the cost right. of this. Yep. And then that will amortize this unavoidable coordination cost. That, I, that's how I like to think about it. I'm paying this cost here in terms of, say, inactive threads. And of course, I also need to pay a cost in terms of barrier synchronization to coordinate these threads. So I have some unavoidable coordination cost when I do the parallel reduction. The goal is to make sure that, that that is not a significant fraction of the total running time. So if I do a lot of sequential work per thread, then the coordination cost can't be big in comparison. That's basically the goal. Um, there's a similar argument to be made about the kernel level of coordinating kernels. Right? So each one of these log n steps has to do two things that are kind of bad. One is it has to globally synchronize by terminating the kernel. And synchronization is, of course, expensive uh, relatively to, to, relative to work. And it's to be avoided when possible, right? whether we're talking about within a block or globally. You, you don't want to synchronize unnecessarily. It's unavoidable, but you want to mi minimize the, the amount of synchronization you're performing. The other thing you have to do is that between each step, I have to write out the partial sums I've computed to external memory, yep. and then read them back in later. Mm -hmm. And that kind of data movement in and out, if I can avoid it, that would be preferable. right? Because I'm sure you've already mentioned in lectures so yep. far, mm -hmm. one of the, the bane of efficiency is often poor use of, of memory bandwidth. Mm -hmm. So by going to this kind of structure, First of all, I, I substantially reduce the number of partial sums I'll ever write out. In this particular case, you know, I showed you some code that picks at most 500 blocks. So the number of partial sums I write out is at most 500, instead of, say, n over 128 or n over 256, which would be substantially bigger if n is big. Right? Um, the other thing I minimize is the number of global synchronizations I need to perform. Right? There's only one global synchronization here, which is better than log n. may not be drastically better than log n, but it's better. And then the third benefit I get from this structure is that it allows me to have lots of elements per thread and do this. You know, if, if we go back to this code, I said, have every thread do as much sequential work as possible before you get to this, uh, this parallel phase. And if we look at that code, uh, let's see, can you see my pointer on the WebEx? Yes. Yep. OK. So this, this part of the code right here, every thread in the block is doing an independent sequential summation. Correct. Then there's one barrier at the bottom. And then ignore the fact that that says scan. It should say reduce. Yeah. <laughs> At the end, I do a single parallel reduction. So the fact that I have given each block a big chunk of data rather than one element per thread means that I can do this code reorganization because every thread will have multiple values that it can be processing. So those are the key things about this code that make it more efficient. Basically, you know, avoiding unnecessary synchronization, avoiding unnecessary global memory movement, and um, although the coordination of barriers and so forth is, is unavoidable, you want to make that a small fraction of the total work you're doing, rather than a large fraction. In fact, uh, this coding style reminds me of some of the MPI reduce coding style. <laughs> uh, I, I actually have never written an MPI program, but yes. <laughs> it would be the same thing, right? If you're constantly calling MPI reduce to yep. reduce values across your entire cluster, yep. that's bad. Right? Yep. You want to do it once because it's yep. expensive. Yeah. Yep. And, and of course, we're in a completely different performance regime here. Calling a kernel is not that expensive. But compared to adding up a couple numbers, it's hugely expensive. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Clarifications? UCLS one uh, in numerical algebra, when we add floating point numbers, the order of in which we add is impo also important, right? Yes, of course. Yes. Yeah, so I said, uh, let me see. 
So you'll notice on the slide it says must be commutative and associative. And uh, you know that, that is true. You'll only get the correct answer, at the same identical answer as the sequential version, if the operation is commutative and associative. The truth is, floating point operations don't really satisfy this requirement. Right? Floating point addition mm -hmm. is not associative. It's only sort of quasi-associative. As I said, when you're, when you're writing this kind of code, you need to be aware of what the properties of your operators is. And this is definitely one thing you need to be aware of. If you do parallel reduction on floating point numbers, you will see discrepancies from the sequential version. I would argue that in most cases, that's perfectly reasonable. I mean, if you're, if you're writing a serious numerical method, you have to deal with this anyway. right? You can't just blithely disregard the properties of IEEE floating point. There are, you can also construct uh, bad cases for both, right? So there are, there, are, there are sequences of numbers for which the sequential implementation will be totally wrong, and the, the parallel summation tree will be just right. And there are, of course, se sequences of numbers where the sequential version will be completely correct, and the parallel version will be wrong. So you know, which one is better? I don't know. It's just the vagaries of floating point. But you're absolutely right. You need to be. You need to deal with that, right? So if you're if you're writing a numerical solver, and you're say you have your reference implementation and a CPU, and you're writing this GPU solver, and you execute both of them, and you get slightly different numbers, that doesn't mean one is broken. That means floating point is kind of weird, and hardware implementations of floating points differ. To give you another example, I mean since this actually comes up when people use our library and they ask us about the the, the behavior. You know, uh, if you run the solver on a in -core, Intel multi-core chip, you know their floating point implementation is based on FMAD instructions. On Fermi, our floating point is based on fused multiply add instructions. So you get slight mm -hmm. discrepancy because when you do an FMAD, you might lose a little bit of precision. If you do an FMA, you don't. So you get slightly different answers in the end. So you have to be very careful when you compare floating point results on two different machines that you're actually comparing the right thing. Any other questions from the uh, from all the sides? Last call. Okay, if not, let's thank Michael. Okay.